So this is really the start of my part of the course where Robert has given you the background on Fourier series you would have done, uh, Fourier transform, the Laplace transform, so all the linear systems stuff, uh, linear time invariant systems, which is transfer functions, um, and the convolution theorems, the convolution multiplication. So really, you should have the background now where you know enough about linear systems and transforms that I can take you now and, and bring you into discrete time uh, signal processing, what, what we call digital signal processing. Um, so, switch to black. So here's a, an illustration of what we're going to be dealing with. So I draw a picture. Um, let's call this f of t, some function of time. So you're used to seeing these, and you'll see many more diagrams like this. Just to tell you what we're going to deal with, or what we could be dealing with, one would be, could be discrete in value. So if I, if I quantize like this, at discrete levels, and this is how all real digital signal processing on a computer, this is how it works. So we represent a number with a, a certain number of bits, 2 to the power of whatever is a 64-bit computer, 64 bits, and that gives us a large number of levels where we can represent the number. And usually with 64 bits, that's a huge, huge uh, number of levels squeezed into a range of voltages that we normal, normally sample if we talk about sampling voltage or some other, some other parameter. That almost, as far as you're concerned, it's continuous. It's almost continuous value, right? It's such a fine, uh, small difference between the values that you don't need to worry about it. So our concern is not going to be, in this course, is not going to be with quantization in this direction, it's going to be about quantization or, or making uh, discrete steps in time. So just to draw that, what we could also do is we can quantize in this direction. And we could have some, and the idea here is that we would take every time that we go to a different time step, we take a value of the signal. Now, obviously, as I just mentioned, if we, if we discretize in value, then we would have to round off to the nearest grid point. Um, but we're not going to worry about that in this, part, in this course. We just worry about uh, going at a discrete time step along the way. So the question is that we're going to deal with first, uh, what should that interval be? How fast should we take samples of the signal in order to uh, perfectly represent it without any loss of information? And this is called the sampling theorem. So let's start, start there. Hang on a second. So I think, has Robert done the sampling theorem with you already? I think he has to an extent. So we're going to go over it again. So it's about sampling and, re and replication of spectra. So that's what we're going to deal with again. Um, so let's redraw this picture where we have some representative signal, which is a function of time. Let's call it f of t. In future lectures, I might start calling it x of t, because f we'll use for frequency. Um, but f here, just remind you, it's a function of time. So it might look like this, perhaps. It's completely arbitrary, just as an example. And perhaps I will, this could be a voltage, maybe, and I want to measure that voltage. So I set up some very rudimentary, one of the first sampling machines, which might be a mechanical sampler. So I've got some electrical contact, and every now and again, I touch a switch off it, I measure the voltage, and then I take the switch away, and I ground it again. So what would that mechanism look like? So it might be that I have maybe some wire, which comes out like this. And I have a switch which can go between two positions. So maybe that can move back and forward. So this is my voltage F of t. At this point here, maybe I get some sample voltage, which I'll write F bar of t. So I'm going to clo open and close this switch periodically. 
um, for a certain amount of time. So I'll make the contact, the voltage will be transferred. If you're an electrical engineer, this will be uh, very intuitive to you. The voltage gets transferred from here to here, and then I break the contact and bring the voltage on this side back to zero. It'll be connected this way. And the kind of voltage signal that we, or waveform that we should get would be, let's keep them lined up with each other if I can. So what will F bar of T look like? Well, let's assume I close the switch at time T equal to zero. Maybe we'll switch color. Go blue. And I keep it closed for a certain amount of time. And then I open it again. And then sometime later I close it. And then I open it again. And sometime later I close it. And so it goes. You get the idea. Now, implicit there is that the original signal is there in the background, and that's what we're sampling. So we'll name some, some time intervals here. The time from open, the first open to the next open will be called capital T. That's the sampling interval. And you will see that all through the notes. So this, this is a very common, uh, con I wouldn't say constant, but um, parameter or, or variable. And that we've got to choose in the design of the system. When, and that's what we're trying to figure out today. What is that T value? What should it be? Can you turn off your phone, please? Is that outside? Yeah, sorry. Okay. So the question is, what is T? Now, just for this illustration, I also need to tell you that this interval here the width of this is maybe, we'll call it tau. So the question that I want to ask you is, can you take a Fourier transform of this signal as it stands like this? So if I said to you, can you take a Fourier transform of the signal, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy, but can it be done, do you think? Sure, of course it can. So right, FT question mark, Fourier transform, can it be done? If t or if tau is greater than zero, the answer is yes. What if tau tends towards zero? Do you remember what the Fourier transform looks like? I know that it's, um, it's a bit of a hideous beast, so it's hard to remember what these things look like. So I'll remind you, um, the Fourier transform of that signal, which we'll write f bar j omega, so it's always the integral of the signal, whatever it is, multiplied by e to the minus j omega t dt. And the signal that we care about is f bar t, e to the minus j omega t dt. And that's over all of time, so from the beginning of time to the end of time. So the question I'm asking you is, don't think about Fourier transforms, just think about some mathematics. Is it possible to evaluate this integral? Now, this is just some numbers, some complex numbers. That's our e to the j, omega, whatever. Um, and then this is some function. Now, to think about what an integral is. It's, it's an integral finds the area under a curve. So I've taken some function of time, which is a sine and a cosine, uh, weaving the way through time. And then I have this other function that I'm going to multiply by it. And think about what's going to be left over. Not, not very much, actually. If, if I just let tau head towards 0, these things are going to get more and more narrow until there's nothing left. There's no area under the curve. And it doesn't matter what I multiply it by, there won't be any area left to integrate. So the answer is, um, for this example, no. And how are we going to solve this problem? So this is part of the reason why it gets a little bit, the notation gets a bit uh, the mathematics appears to get a little bit more tricky. Just to solve this problem, we have to bring in this uh, um, Dirac delta function, which is a little bit alien and scares people a bit. But we have to do it. If we want to take integrals to get Fourier transforms, we need to have some, some mechanism, mathematical mechanism to deal with this, this problem of a vanishing integral. So we have the delta function. There's two types. This is a Dirac one, which is for continuous time.
you've seen this before, so this is a refresher, um, that it can be defined, I'm sure it can be defined in many ways, but one way is to define it as um, taking this function which has some area, a rectangular function, and using the notation that we had, So we set up this function which has a width and time of tau and it has a height of 1 over tau. And the reason we choose 1 over tau for the height is so that the area underneath that curve, that, that function is equal to 1. And then we let tau tend towards 0. Let's watch out for the camera there. Um, if we let tau tend towards 0, then we get this unusual function which is actually difficult to draw. Um, so I'm going to draw my usual axes. This is the function delta of tau. Maybe I'll switch color. It is zero everywhere except for at this one point where it heads off to infinity. Now the problem with drawing this stuff, and that's why you see this strange arrow, is that I can't draw to infinity, being facetious, so I've got to find a way to represent the fact that this is a, a, a function of time which underneath that very small area, which is actually a width of zero in the limit, there is an area of one. So its height is infinity. And the way we draw that is we just draw a straight line up, which shows that there's zero width, and we have an arrow saying, the top is at infinity, all the way to the top. So this has an area equal to 1 also. And its width is 0. So the value of this is when I multiply this by my function, when I'm doing this sampling which is what we're working towards, I take the function which is continuous in time and I multiply it by this bizarre function which in the previous um, page was this closing mechanical gate. Now the mechanical gate is going to close only for well, uh, f an absolutely infinitely small amount of time. But the function that we get back will have, at each of those points, will have an area of 1 multiplied by the function, by the actual original function underneath so we can do the integral. So to do this sampling, this is just one sample in time that I'm going to multiply by the function. I need to have a lot of them because I'm going to sample periodically, tap, 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 all the way across. So I need to set up uh, a sequence of these, what we call a delta train or the Sha function. I think Robert calls it Sha, which is drawn like this. So I think you should be familiar with this now as well. Um, the diagram will be as you expect. Sorry, bring this down. Time will run this way, and we want to have a function, maybe that's delta t, which means time is zero there. So the delta function only takes on the value when time is equal to zero. But I want to get another one shifted over here at some sampling interval t seconds later. This is at time t, and that function is going to be t delta t minus capital T, big T. So let's remember from the first lecture, and you've probably seen this a few times now, shifting in time. If you want to shift to the right, basically you want to make something happen later in time, you've got to delay time inside here so it happens a little bit later in time. So this is happening t seconds later, and this is how we achieve that. And so it goes. The next one will be at delta t minus 2t, and so on, forever in both directions. So how would I write that as a mathematical expression? It will be an infinite sum. It, it's quite convenient that none of these guys takes any value elsewhere, because I can imagine each one as its own function in time, across all of time. So I've got an infinite number of functions to add together. Um, but because they take a zero value everywhere elsewhere, I can just add them straight together and it's really straightforward. They, they don't interfere with each other in time. They're, they're non-overlapping. So that means I could write this, and the notation will be subscript t, 
that tells me it's a delta function, uh, a delta train. So there we go. That's the expression for this delta train. It's an infinite sum. Stuff sounds scary, an infinite sum. Oh my god, how are we going to deal with that? Don't, don't worry, it's, it's just not uh, maths, maths and notation. So we've got this infinite sum of delta functions, and that gives us the train. And that's what we're going to use to do the sampling. So we can move into sampling next. I think I'll draw the picture first, and then I'll give you the maths. So the picture will, <coughs> we've got some function that we care about, f of t, and now I have my delta train, And all sampling means is that we multiply these two together. So I put the two of them into a multiplier. And at the other side, I get. But you can imagine what it's going to look like. Now, now, what I draw next is really just we agree upon this is what it means, OK? Because I can't multiply an infinitely tall delta function by some waveform and sensibly give you an answer, except for we have to agree on what this picture is going to mean. So what I want to do is I want to represent that if I multiply, this has an area of 1, but if I multiply it by a signal which at that point has a value of 5, then the area underneath this thing is going to become 5. But it still goes to infinity in terms of its height, it's just that it has an area of 5. So how do I represent the area? Well, in a very similar way to I draw, as which I draw this picture, I just change the height of the arrow. So when you see the, the height of the arrow changing, what that means is the area underneath the arrow, the delta function is being, being modulated. So let me just draw some guidelines. Maybe the, the signal looked a bit like this. So I'm going to get some image which looks like that. And this is my F bar of T. So this is sampling. Now, this is a purely mathematical construct. Obviously, when we do this practically, we don't have delta functions. We have electronics that just grab the voltage and hold it for a little bit. It is possible to show, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later in the course, that these things are essentially equivalent. Um, but in terms of analyzing what's happening, this is a very convenient way to do it. So this is all sort of impossible mathematics that could never be realized in the real world. But because it's very conveniently uh, arranged, we can actually do, do the analysis very uh, almost trivially. Well, not trivially, but it's much easier than trying to do it with the system, which is a real system, um, straight off the bat. The equations for this are that f bar, let me pull this down, the sample signal, f bar of t, is equal to f of t multiplied by this infinite sum of shifted delta functions. And something to note here is that if I pick, if I want to evaluate this function, it really doesn't take on any value except at multiples of n times t. Because this delta function, or the train of delta functions, has no value anywhere in between. Um, so what I can do is I can bring this f inside and just tack it onto the delta function. So whenever that delta function lights up, it takes the value of the function at that point in time, and we move on to the next item in the summation. So this could be written as f at n t delta t minus n t. Okay. So we're almost up to the sampling theorem now. We just need to calculate the spectrum of this, so the Fourier transform of this.
Now, I apologize because we don't have time to do the full derivation. It's not too hard, but I'm going to rely on, um, there's a desk in the middle, at the, uh, second last row in the middle, if you can squeeze in. Um, we're going to rely on the complex Fourier series, and if you want to go and have a look in the notes, it's in there, and I link it to probably to Wikipedia or somewhere where you can look at it. The idea should be known to you now that you can represent a signal uh, as an infinite sum of, of a periodic signal as an infinite sum of sines and cosines. So we're going to use that uh, as a tool to help us calculate the spectrum. So I'll just say, I apologize, I don't like to do this to not give a proof, but we don't have time. So I'll just say using uh, Fourier series, this delta function can be represented as an infinite sum of cosines. The reason I say cosines, um, this stuff, you probably haven't internalized all this stuff yet, but depends on how I draw this shaft function. If I center it with the first delta right on, the, on zero, then the function is even. Whatever, the, the next one happens on the right by t you know, in, in negative time, and the other one happens in positive time t, t seconds later. So it's going to be a, a perfectly even function. And even functions, if you're going to do a Fourier series, the only thing which lines up with an even function is a cosine, because cosine is 1 at 0, and time is equal to 0. So it's going to be, you, could do the, you can go through the maths and work out the coefficients for it, for the Fourier series, but it's going to be a sum of cosines. Um, so all I'll say is remember, we did this in the first week, that cos of theta is equal to e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta over 2. So I'm sort of skirting around the issue here of the actually doing the Fourier series um, to try and give you a sense that you can represent this signal as an infinite sum of cosines. Um, and the way it's written is actually in complex exponentials. So what the answer is after you go through all the derivation is that this delta function, this delta train, will be 1 over t. That's the Fourier coefficient. They're all the same. For this delta function, it's an unusual function. All the Fourier series coefficients are exactly the same. They're all 1 over t. And we have n equal to minus infinity to infinity, e to the j, n, sorry, omega naught t, where omega naught is equal to 2 pi over t. So that's the periodicity of that. So if you go off and have a look, it is possible to see that all this is related, and you'll end up with, this is a Fourier series of that periodic function. It's a, it's a delta function every t seconds, and that's its, that's its complex Fourier series. So now, therefore, to get my sample signal, I'm going to just multiply the original signal by this, which is not Previously, we had an infinite sum of delta functions. This is easier to deal with. It's not an infinite sum of delta functions. It's an infinite sum of complex exponentials. So we get 1 over t. The function that we're interested in multiplied by e to the j n omega naught t. I think, yeah, let, let's finish it on this page. So I take Laplace transform. I'll get f of s is equal to So let me not jump in now. Probably hard for some of you at the back to see this. So what we're doing is we're going to take the Laplace transform of this um, slightly ugly looking expression, which is an infinite sum 
of the function multiplied by complex exponentials. So let's do them one at a time. So if I said here's a function and it's multiplied by a, some exponential e to the power of alpha t, what will the Fourier seri uh, for, uh, uh, apologies Laplace, trans Laplace transform be of that? So don't get bamboozled by all the notation and there's, there's symbols everywhere. All this is, it's a function, let's call it x of t, it's f of t here, multiplied by e to the alpha t. If I took the Laplace transform of that, what would it be? Pardon? e to the, yeah, so this is like e to the alpha t, but when you take the Laplace transform, so if I took the Laplace tr transform of the function of time, I just get, I write f of s. That's, that's just a, f of t goes to f of s. If I multiply it by e to the alpha t, or e to the minus alpha t here, I get f of s plus alpha. So go and have a look at your Laplace transforms and remember how that works. Uh, I'll write it down on, on, in the margin now, but what you'll get is that this is equal to f of s and the alpha in our case is j apologies there's a mistake here that's a plus yeah there we go minus n omega naught so I'm sorry I'm so used to writing minus j that's that's a plus from the from the Fourier series so if that was e to the alpha and the alpha in our case is j n omega naught t then the Laplace transform is the Laplace transform was shifted j n omega naught. And this is all very abstract, but we're just using the mathematical tools that we've learned. I'll, I'll draw a picture of what it means now. Um, but just in the margin before that, remember the Laplace transform of f of t e to the minus, or actually plus alpha t equals f of s and minus alpha. So that's the Laplace transform. You would have studied that, I hope, in the previous weeks. So now we have almost, we're almost there, one more line and we're done. Got the spectrum of the signal. So to get what we call the frequency response of a system, Sorry. You set S equal to J omega. So the Laplace transform is quite a general transform. It just means that for any signal where starting at time equal to zero, you can work out it's 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 almost like a, a response to a, to a, a kick or an impulse. But if we want what's called a frequency response, which means that the signal is running freely for all time and it's settled into its steady state, the system is just chugging over, and it hasn't just started up. Then you set s equal to j omega. So it takes away the real part of the s, which encodes. Uh, an exponential decay or growth, it's not, that's gone, there's no, there's no decaying or transitioning towards steady state, it's already there. So we plug this in to get the steady state response, frequency response of the system. Um, so what we get now from our Laplace transform is f bar j omega is equal to 1 over t. I'm just going to plug it in to what we had, it's, it's an infinite sum. Take the j outside, so we have omega minus n times omega naught. What does that mean? So what you see is this is replicate what we call replication. So if we didn't, before we did any sampling, all we had was the Fourier transform of the function, which is f of j omega, forget about that. That was it. But now because we've sampled with this infinite sum of delta functions, something, two strange things have happened. One is that 
we've got multiple copies of the spectrum. So this is shifting. Remember shifting to the right, so omega, subtracting off n times omega naught, which is the sampling interval in radians, uh, converted to frequency in radians. I've got a copy out at 2 pi over t. I get another copy of 4 pi over t, and same in the other direction. Because it's an infinite sum, these copies happen all over the place. So let's just draw a little sketch. So now I have, maybe that was the spectrum, and this is omega equal to 0. It's been scaled. If it previously, maybe its height was 1. Now it's 1 over t in its amplitude. But if I have... I'm just going to write 2 pi over t, which is equal to omega naught, 1 at omega naught. I'll get a copy out here as well. And similarly down here, at minus omega naught, I'll get another copy, and so on, forever, in both directions, forever and ever. So we get this bizarre replication behavior because of these delta functions. Another way we could have thought about this was convolution multiplication. So we multiplied a signal by a, del a tr delta train in the time domain. So because it's multiplication in one domain, we get convolution in the other. So this is the, would, would have been the result of taking the original waveform and convolving it with an infinite delta train. Because the delta train just spikes like this, and the first one will slide past, perfectly reproduce the spectrum, and then the next one will slide on, and that will reproduce a copy somewhere else, and so it will go. So we could have arrived at this result by multiplication, by the convolution theorem as well, but we chose to use Fourier series. OK, so we need to push on. What are the implications of this? We're trying to get to the sampling theorem, which is the Nyquist rate. This is the, 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 the big punchline punch in all of this stuff. What's the point? Who cares, right? Remember, we're trying to choose what this t value is. What's the sampling interval? And intuitively, you want to sample as slowly as you possibly could because it's going to be expensive. It's going to make your, your processor hot. If you've got to have a clock which is ticking over very fast, you've got to deal with all the data which you capture, so you need a lot of memory. So really, if you can avoid it, you want to sample as slowly as possible without loss of information. So the question is, how, what is the, the smallest amount that I can sample without causing some problems? So I had some nice diagrams. I'm not going to draw them out because we're going to run out of time, but you can probably see what's going to happen here. I'll just draw a, a simplified version. If I don't sample at a high enough rate, so maybe this is my spectrum, and this has some frequency omega um, m, and minus omega m. If I sample at this rate, that's fine. There's no overlap. The problem is that I don't want to have, have any overlap, because once I overlap them, they start adding together. And I'm not sure what's going on. I can never separate them again. It's like mixing paint in a tin. I can't really get the colors apart afterwards. So really, I don't, whatever, wherever this lands, I don't want it to impinge or overlap with this part here. So I've got to have it centered so there's no overlap. And you can see it's pretty straightforward then to see. The next copy, at its absolute minimum, can be here, and so on. The next copy will be here, and um, so this is my two pi over t, and that's going to be equal to two omega m. Do you agree? So it's just two widths. It's just the width of the spectrum. And the spectrum, is always, you always get a copy on the negative side when you do the mathematics. So that's the negative part, which is the same width. So it's omega m, omega m. So if I sample any less than that, they're going to overlap with each other, and then I'm in trouble. So that's the minimum. If we turn this into frequency, um, remember, <coughs> let's just do it here. So we have 2 pi on t. And this is equal to 2 by 2 pi by f m, which is the maximum frequency. Um, so get rid of 2 pi from both sides. And then I have fs, which is a sampling frequency, equal to 1 over t is equal to 2 fm. And I don't want to say equal to. I want to say greater than or equal to. So maybe let's write it like this. Because I can go. There's no problem with going faster than that. So I want the sampling rate fs to be greater 
then are equal to twice the maximum frequency in the signal. And then I'm good. And this is called the Nyquist straight. So Harry Nyquist, another very clever guy who I think was at Bell Labs in the probably 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, I don't know. A lot of really bright guys hanging around Bell Labs in the middle part of the last century. Um, okay, just one more point on sampling aliasing. So what is this problem? Uh, it's a bit abstract to say I don't want the spectra to overlap and therefore I can't get the signal back. What does that actually mean? Well, here's an example where maybe I have a signal. Let's not draw that one. Let's draw this one. So intuitively, you would think that maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. You, you would try and reason how fast you should sample the signal if it was a sinusoid to represent it again. So if we agree the basis, what we call the basis, is, is a sinusoid, that the, the simplest form of a signal is a sinusoid, um, how could I sample the signal to represent it? And what you see is that maybe I could sample once per period. I sample here and here and here and here and here and here. Would that do the job for me to, rep, to, to let me know after the fact, or if I hand it to a stranger, would that let them know that that was a sinusoid of a certain frequency? So if I had samples here, 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 and here? No, because they'd come along and they'd see a bunch of line, uh, samples all in a straight line and they'll assume that it's a, a DC signal. So that wouldn't help them very much. So obviously you've got to go faster and it turns out, as we've proven, you've got to at least hit it twice per cycle. You don't have to hit it right you don't have to hit it perfectly on the peak and trough because even if you hit it here and here, I still know because we've agreed that the sinusoid is the basis, there's only one sinusoid that will fit through that. The problem comes if I sample too slowly. Let's say I, I sample maybe here. I'm trying to do this, it's always tricky. Um, here, here, here. If I sample at some other rate which is not fast enough, then there is a signal which will pass through those points. So this rate that I'm sampling at is not fast enough. It's not more than twice the frequency that I'm interested in. And therefore, if I hand it to a stranger and I say, tell me what the signal is, they'll probably fit the lowest frequency signal that goes through those points. And that is what we call aliasing. So you can end up not being able to figure out what the signals were. So you've got to make sure you sample at twice the rate. Okay, so just a little picture, and then we'll move on to the Fourier transform. So diagrammatically, or block diagram, you will always have a low-pass filter, the anti, what we call anti-alias filter, and then you sample. A sampler, I'll just call it. So we have our signal coming in, F of T, and maybe we get some F low pass filtered version of T, and then we end up with our F hat of T. <coughs> so this is band limited. This is all jargon. Band limited means that before, I don't want aliasing to happen. So I definitely don't want it to happen. So even if I'm going to alter the original signal to avoid aliasing, I'm happy to do that. So you take a signal, and before, maybe I can't sample fast enough. Maybe I find out that the highest frequency in that signal is some gigahertz or something. I just think I cannot sample at twice that frequency or more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to destroy the signal to get it to a frequency where I can sample it. So you have an ant a low-pass anti-alias filter, and that makes sure that pretty much all the high-frequency stuff is gone. So that when I sample it with the sampler and I get the replication, I won't get this overlapping aliasing effect. So this is often neglected. Sometimes you can neglect it if, you know, in practice, empirically you know there's not a lot of high-frequency stuff, but it's bad practice to not put it there. So before you sample into the digital world, you should always have a low-pass filter. If it's, if, it's a, if it's a low pass system, 
for a bandpass system like telecoms, they use very high frequencies, they have a bandpass filter. So everything that comes into your mobile phone, it all gets bandpass filtered before it gets processed. Okay, let's push on. So we're going to move into the stuff now. Now that you know about sampling and choosing sampling rates, which is really very important, we're going to talk about the discrete Fourier transform. And uh, this lecture is a little bit long. It often goes for about an hour and 20 minutes, so we've, we've got a bit more to go. Um, so I guess I apologize for, for bombarding you with information. But we've got to set up for the lab. This is the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform. Um, we're going to take two steps to get there. The first is I'm going to do the discrete time Fourier transform, and then we make the jump to what is discrete time um, finite time Fourier transform. It's, it's, a, it's a, a more simplified or um, approximated version of, of something that we can't calculate. Um, a bit of notation because I don't want to carry around all this bulky NT all the time, so we've got to write some notation. So in the analog world, our signal we had written, just to remind you, signal was F of T. The samples of that signal we had written so far as the value of the function at every t time interval, so 0, t, 2t, 1t, 2t, 3t. Um, but now, so just to remind you, that was f of t evaluated at t equal to nt. But we're going to write that now in, with square brackets of n. And this is called a sample index. Now, different textbooks do it differently, and unfortunately, that's the way the world is. Some people like get into conventions of writing things certain ways, and you often have to be a little bit flexible to deal with different textbooks and different ways of writing things. Some use a circular bracket, some use a square bracket. I prefer to use square because that, in my mind, alerts me to the fact that I'm in the digital world. I'm dealing with samples. If you want to use circular brackets, that's also okay. I don't mind. So let's start with the discrete time Fourier transform. So really, in a way, we've done this already, OK? So when we, we took a sample signal and we sampled it, and we took the Fourier transform of that signal, and we got this replication. That, that was just a way to think about the, the sampling theorem and, and what the sampling rate should be. Now I want to think about how do I calculate that in practice. This is about implementation. We're going to do it on a computer. That's what the lab is going to be today. You're going to implement the Fourier transform. So these steps are, I tell you about the discrete time Fourier transform, which we just dealt with. I tell you why you can't ever implement it, because it's ridiculous. And then I teach you about how we, 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 we agree to implement it. And then I'll talk about the fast Fourier transform, which is a, a very clever and efficient way to implement that algorithm, which we won't go into the details. That would take about two hours. Um, but I'll just give you a hint at how it's done. Also designed by somebody from Bell Labs, I think, but way back when. OK, so the Fourier transform we know already f of j omega, it's the integral over to all time of the function multiplied by e to the j omega t dt. So for us, we have our sample function, which was this infinite sum of samples, I should write um, f of n. Uh, let's not mix notations. Let's just keep it at f of n t delta n t minus c. Okay, so we arrived at that uh, that um, expression previously. When I sample the signal, I take it, I multiply it by an infinite 
train of deltas and I can bring that f inside and just evaluate at those particular values where it's non-zero. So if I plug that in, I get my spectrum. This is really this, what we've done already, but coming at it from a different angle. And I get the integral over all time of f bar t. Um, so this is nothing special. I've just written down the Fourier transform twice with a different function this time. This is the sample function. And now what I get, if you look at this, it takes a little, a little bit of time just to digest what's happening, but we're going to do an integral of some function over all of time. Don't lose sight of what the function is. This thing is a bunch of spikes with different heights. It's the sample signal. So it goes spike, spike, spike over time. So if I'm going to integrate something which only spikes at certain times, do I really need to do an integral? Maybe I should just do a summation. I'll sum up the values at every point in time. So that integral can sort of degenerate into a, or deteriorate into a sum, which is uh, easier to deal with. So I get a sum. I'll just evaluate the function where it takes on values. So remember, an integral is a summation over a continuous amount of, of uh, variables, but now we only have discrete points in time to worry about. So we will get f of n t e to the minus j omega n capital T. Where did the delta functions go? There were delta functions in here, so they would, they would appear in here. But remember, we're doing an integral. So it's just the area under the delta function is the value of the function at that point in time. And that's what gives me the f of nt. So I understand this stuff is a little bit tricky if you're not used to seeing infinite sums and doing integrals on delta functions. So you might want to go away and think about it a little bit. Um, so here we are. This is our discrete time Fourier transform. Um, what will I say about it? Just about properties. All I'll say is it's pretty much the same as the Fourier transform. So let's write this. This is a discrete time Fourier transform. Pretty much the same as the Fourier transform in that, you know, if you add two functions together, the Fourier transform is the sum of all this linearity and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, the only difference is that, and we've seen this already, it's a replication, is that it's periodic. So except, and this periodicity thing is going to come up all through the rest of the course for digital uh, systems. They're all, they all have this periodic spectrum behavior. So the, the way we write periodicity like this is that uh, we've already done this, so we're just writing it out again. Plus or minus m 2 pi over t, which is the sampling. It was omega naught the last time um, for all m. So all it means is that if I move on up the frequency scale by a whole sampling frequency in, in radians per second, I'll get the exact, exact same value. It just keeps repeating itself forever and ever in both directions. It's periodic. Um, so anyway, what are the problems with this? What do I not like about it? There's two problems. The summation is infinite. So like we're trying to do this on a computer. That's what we're going to do in the lab today. I'm going to give you some signals, and you're going to go and do a Fourier transform of it. And if I say to you, implement this function, you're going to end up trying to make the computer do an infinite sum. And well, you know what's going to happen next. The other problem, I wouldn't so much say it's a problem, um, but it's something we need to consider, is that the transform, this sounds really opaque. The transform variable is continuous. What do I mean by that? People get quite confused when they start, and this is, will become clear to you in the lab and over the following weeks. 
we're sampling the signal in time, discreetly in time. That's the only thing that's discrete. Okay? So the only thing where you see discrete values is going to be really discrete values is going to be in time. So we sample across in time. When we go to the spectrum, the spectrum is continuous. It's a smooth, beautiful curve. But when you implement it on a computer, you get a list of numbers out, and people think, okay, it was discrete in time, therefore it's discrete in frequency. That's not true. That's not the case. The problem is we can't evaluate all of the values of the spectrum uh, in frequency. So we've got to choose a finite set and just evaluate enough of them so we can see what the pattern is. Um, so omega is continuous. There's no reason I can't have any frequency um, in my signal. Why would I have to have discrete values of frequency? So the, the spectrum is totally smooth and continuous, um, and we need to draw a picture of it. So how are we going to do that? Well, normally when you've got to draw a picture of something which is continuous, you take a bunch of samples of it, and that's what we'll do. So let's just deal with these two, what I'm calling problems, on the next, the next page. And the solutions are not fantastical. They're exactly what you would expect you, you would arrive at after one minute of, of deep thought. And this is, will, will give us what is called the discrete Fourier transform. So I know I'm writing that heading again, but this is more of a subheading. We finally arrived at what is the discrete Fourier transform. So the solution to one will be a finite sum. So we'll have that f bar of j omega, which is the spectrum of the sample signal, will be equal to, I should write approximately equal to, but I'll just say equal to by our definition for this discrete Fourier transform from n equal to 0. So not n equal to minus infinity, n equal to 0. So I've left a lot of number, numbers at up to big N minus 1. So that's a sum over n, sum over n samples of the function which I can now write let's switch to um, discrete notation the nth sample e to the minus j omega n t that's from the previous page exactly the same so this is exactly the same the only thing I've changed is um, I've used a different notation for the, va the in uh, discrete values of uh, intervals in time for the function and I'm summing over only n samples now and we're going to talk about what, what that screws up for us later on. But what about omega? Omega equals what? So the spectrum is going to look a little bit like, let's say, let's make a spectrum up. Maybe it looks like that, and that's zero. And then at 2 pi over t, the next copy happens, and that looks like that. Um, and that, remember, it's periodic, so I don't need to sample across all of frequency forever. If I can do one full period, and not even, I don't even need to go right to there, because, because it's periodic, the value at 0 is the same as the value here. So I don't even need to go that far. And I'm, any, I've got to pick, I'm going to basically sample this, uh, maybe what does it look like, check some values along there and see what it looks like. Um, how would I do that? So I've just got to say, well, maybe I'll do M, capital M samples across that spectrum. And let's space, space them out evenly in, across the frequencies. But I'll stop just short of that guy um, and see what that gives us. And the expression for that, it wouldn't take you long to calculate it. Um, oh. So you'll do 0, and then you'll do, I hope this doesn't confuse you, but it's going to be 2 pi over t. That's the sampling frequency, 2 pi over t. I'm just going to take 1 mth of that. It's hard to say, 1 mth. And then the next one is going to be at 2 mths of that by 2 pi over t. So you get 4 pi, right? I'm um, sorry. <coughs> t, and so on, up to... Um, basically little m minus 1 over m by 2 pi over t. G was 
Let's just fix that. Sorry, just trying to fix something. Okay. So I hope you can see that what we're doing is we're just taking M samples across that interval and we're stopping just short of a full period across the spectrum. So we'll end up getting, you know, like one at zero and then one here and here and here and here and here and here. But stopping just short. Now, don't confuse this with sampling in time. It is a kind of sampling, but I just want to see what the spectrum looks like. So I take a bunch of values across there. And you can imagine what will happen now if I don't take enough. And this is part of the lab today. I, I say, do an eight-point FFT or DFT, whatever. And you say, OK. And you have a signal which are samples I gave you. And you take eight points across here. And you go, aha, I think I can see the frequency of the signal. And then I say, how about try 16? And then it looks different all of a sudden. And I go, let's push it. Let's do 512. Go ex extremely you know, dense across the, the spectrum. And you'll see the, the true shape of the spectrum emerge. So it's just about being careful not to under, undersample that. All right. So there's some properties here which I'm not going to talk about. They're the same as uh, Fourier transform where, um, for example, uh, maybe I will talk a little bit. If I go maybe this value here and I find it's a similar value at that point here, they will be complex conjugates of each other. If I take m to be an even number, that means there's no, there's a sort of symmetry here. And if I take m to be an even number, I'll end up with one stuck in the middle here. That will be a real number. And that, there's these various properties about the, the behavior. It's, just a, it's a way to save work if you want to do stuff later on where you say, well, if all of these are complex conjugates of these ones, once I get to this point, and you might use this in the exam, for example, you might calculate the DFT as far as here, the fifth one out of eight, and then say, well, six, um, what's going to be next? Five, six, and seven are going to be, so it'll be, you'll do zero, one, two, three, four, the first five of them, which is zero, one, two, three, four, and then the five, six, and seven will be complex conjugates of two, three, and four. Anyway, you'll get a chance to have a look at that. So it has some interesting properties, which is mostly complex conjugation. Um, the inverse DFT. is, I'm not going to prove it, but I'll give it to you. It's not too hard to prove, and I think the proof might be in the notes. 1 over m, this big m. So it's a very similar expression to what we get for the DFT. We get the inverse DFT. Um, you'll get something similar to that for the DFT if you plug in all the numbers for omega that I gave you um, on the previous page. Uh, the only thing to note about this, I just want to draw your attention because, and I think this will be a bit lost on you maybe. I think it will be at this stage. Um, when MATLAB does an inverse DFT or an in inverse FFT, it tends to assume, and this is what a lot of people assume, that you have to have the same number of frequency points. So these, this m, how many points in frequency do you take? Traditionally, we tend, if, if I've got 10 samples of, of time in time, I will tend to use 10 values of the spectrum. And why we do that is simply because I can't take any less or I'll be losing information and I won't be able to do the inverse transform because I've I had 10 numbers, I did a transform, I should end up with at least 10 numbers in order to be able to go backwards again. So we never go less than there are number of samples, but you can go more. So I could go have 10 samples in time, but evaluate a thousand different frequency values. MATLAB won't be able to do the inverse DFT then, because it doesn't use this equation. So if you use this equation, you can take your thousand samples across the frequency spectrum and return back to 10 samples in time, no problem. So you will implement this. I think I asked you to implement this, and you realize that it's not the same as what MATLAB does, because it, it expects n to n, and n going back to n again, the opposite direction. So it's a subtlety that if you ever needed to use those functions, you would end up getting the wrong answer. OK, I understand this is a long lecture, so we've got really just two, two more topics to talk about. Three, two. 
three, and then uh, we'll go to the lab. You can have a little break. So the three topics I want to talk about. One is windowing, right? So we've, we've just taken this finite. We, we had an infinite sum to do the Fourier transform, and now we've decided, oh well, let's just do n samples and see how we go. Um, I'm going to tell you how you're going to go because it does make a difference how many samples you choose. So windowing. Uh, and the other two things I'll talk about, uh, fast Fourier transform, very, very briefly, and we'll talk about what's called zero appending, which relates to the fast Fourier transform because fast Fourier transform likes to have powers of two, and if you don't have a power of two, how are you going to get around that? So um, you just stick a bunch of zeros on the end, and it works. The maths tells you that it works. So we'll talk very briefly about those two. But wind windowing is important, and we're going to talk about it, uh, particularly next week when we look at filter design, you're going to see this effect. So, so we sum over n samples we sum over n samples what are the consequences Well, let's look at a window. Let's call this W of T. And I think you've seen some of these things already, right? The rectangle oh, is badly drawn. So you've seen the rectangular function already, haven't you? And you would have done the Fourier transform of it, and you'll get a sync. Um, so you can go and look at my notes. I think Robert has covered it as well. Um, so the Fourier transform of W of t is equal to k sine of omega k, don't confuse that with w over 2, to all divided by um, not omega, w. Yes, omega. Uh. <laughs> over 2. Um, and not strangely, it's a real number, always real, and the reason is because this is an even function, so you could represent it with an infinite summation of or integral of cosines, and cosine, if you look at the Fourier series, it's cos plus Something cos plus j times something sine. That's the like the Fourier, how the Fourier series works, and similarly for Fourier transform. So anyway, it's a real number, and we're not surprised about that. Um, and this is the sync function, which will look. Um, we'll do this kind of thing in frequency. We would write that as. Um, W of J omega. Okay, why am I telling you about this? Well, imagine previously I had this infinite signal that went off in both directions for all time, and I said, I'm going to sample it. So I took a bunch of deltas and I sampled it at all these points a long time. And then I said, well, I can't sum all of those guys up to do the Fourier transform. I'm just going to sum N of them. How do I represent that, that act of whittling it down to only N samples mathematically. And one trick is to multiply by a window. So I say, well, how about this? Let's pretend before or after, after the fact or before or whatever. I multiply the function by a window. So the function goes to zero everywhere else. And therefore, I've essentially ignored those samples. And when I do the summation then, or the, the calculations, I get the answer. So this is a mathemat mathematical trick to allow me to pretend that I'm only summar summing over n samples. And we can see what would happen. So, so let's draw a picture. Hopefully, I can fit this in. It's always a squeeze. So this is like a, uh, an illustration of the process. So maybe I have in time my function, uh, which is f of t. 
and let's pretend I don't know what it looks like. Um, Let's just draw the magnitude because it might not be, it might be complex, so I can't visualize it. So maybe the magnitude, this is a totally a cartoon. I mean, I don't know what spectrum is going to look like that. So maybe I have a signal that goes to infinity in both directions, and then I'm somehow able to do an, that integral to get the, Four the Fourier transform. And I get its real spectrum. And just because I want to draw a picture and show it to you, I take its absolute value, and very luckily it comes out to be a triangle. Okay? It's a cartoon. Um, if I wanted to sample it, then I would multiply it by my delta functions, which is a bunch of guys that look like this, and so on, forever in both directions. So this is my delta t of t. And we've already proven that this can be represented as an infinite sum of cosines. Um, so you get, and they're all at multiples of, of the the frequency that would be the periodicity of this thing. So you end up with, um, let's keep them far enough apart so we don't get aliasing. So that would be at zero. This would be at 2 pi over t. Sugar. Where this is t between these two guys. And so on. And there would be, they would go forever in both directions as well. That's how we get replication. And now I'm going to multiply these two together. So let's draw that picture. You've seen this picture already probably twice at least. Sorry. So we end up with a modulated version of those. So maybe the signal goes like that. Let's just put that in as a guideline. So it still goes off in both directions forever and ever. And what's the spectrum going to look like? Well, we already talked about the fact that we just get replication. So I should end up with my, if that was a height of 1, now it'll, it will be at 1 over t. And I will get multiples copies. And that will go on forever. So this is really as far as we've come. Uh, I've taken you this far already, right, where we had sampling theorem, and we know that we get replication. Now, what's going to happen if I multiply by this window? So let's draw in our window. Which was a square window. This is my W of t. Sorry, my Ws look a bit like omegas. Um, what's the transform of that? We've already written it down on the other page and did a quick sketch of it. Um, it's going to be a stink. I guess I should, I'd drawn it as absolute value, but I, I guess I could write, do the proper sink. Now, <coughs> which way will I do it? Let's do it narrow, quite narrow. It's a sketch, okay. I apologize. It's a bit messy. So this is my spectrum. W of J omega, which happens to be real. It's a sign of something, something over something. And remember, it's just worth mentioning now, if that's K, this width is proportional to 1 over K. You can see it in the function, I think, that um, there's a there should be that the first zero happens um, proportional to 1 over k. So as the window gets wider in time, this thing gets narrower and narrower. So let me draw the last picture, and then I'll come back and talk about it, because that, that's really what it all comes down to, is that, that property. So now I'm going to take my a multiplication of everything together. So I guess I should have written that this was d tau, dt, sorry, multiplied by f of t. And now I put them all together. So I have this one, oh well, which we called f bar of t. So this is f bar of j omega. So let's put them all together. Now I'm going to multiply w of t by f bar of t. 
So I, only, I end up with zero elsewhere except for these handful of samples which fell inside the window. Uh, I think three of them as I've drawn. And that's, all, well, that's all zero. So what's the spectrum going to look like? Well, again, we can use the convolution theorem. So we have multiplication here. I took this one, I multiplied it by a window, and I got this one. So if it's multiplication in the time domain, in one domain, it's convolution in the other. Now, if you don't know, if you haven't, uh, uh, convolution is tricky, you know. Like, I, it took me a while to get my head around it. Um, I think I've made a video available on, on Moodle. You can go and have a look at somebody's done a nice MATLAB uh, animation of convolution happening. Um, it's not straightforward to wrap your head around it. When you see the equation for convolution, forget it. Like, I, I couldn't look at that and just understand what it was. I've got to see a demonstration of it happening. Um, waving my hands around what it means is that I take one signal and I line the other signal up in it, with it. And if I want the value at zero down here, I don't shift this one anywhere. I leave it at zero. I multiply the two of them together to get another function, and then I integrate it. So it's quite complicated, okay? I don't shift, I, I've got some shift, which in the first instance is not zero. Multiply them together, integrate the result. That's quite complicated. Intuitively, what you can think about it for a function like this is that it mostly has a value here. So when I multiply this one by this one, I'm mostly selecting out this part of the this, of this function, and then I integrate it to some, to, I can't use a function, I've got to summarize it to one number, so I, so I add them all up with an integral. And that gives me the value here. Maybe I want the value over here, then I shift this guy out to there, and I multiply it by this one, and that will select out that part of the function, and then I sum it up and put the value down there. So and you do that for all, all different shifts, and that generates the function down here. That's convolution. And that's me wa talking and waving my hand, so I understand if that doesn't suddenly resonate with you. Go and have a look at the, the animations on YouTube. The point is that if I want to use this to select out a part of this function, but it's not, if it's a nice little spike like this, perfect. That's why we get a beautiful replication here. It's a spike. It selects perfectly out of this function the value that I want. But here, this is not a spike. This is some weird, fat-looking sink. So when I multiply by this, it's not going to select out exactly the value I want. It's also going to select some of the values nearby. And that's called spectral leakage, where I'm unfortunately leaking when I'm trying to estimate the spectrum, I'm leaking parts of the spectrum into the neighboring bins. So the result will be, I, I won't be able to draw it, but I'll give you a sketch. Something like, it'll be a bit wobbly like this. And they're all meant to be copies of each other, and so it goes like that. So the point was, I was trying to get this. This is what I wanted, OK? Ideally, I wanted that, but I've got to sample in time because I, I can't keep all the values, so I sample it and I get this. So, so this is what I'm after. And then I, in order to get this, I need to sum an infinite number of delta functions, but I can't do that. So I sum a finite number. And to understand the behavior, I model that with multiplying it by a window, which is only non-zero for a certain number of values. And if I do that modeling, I understand what's going to happen is I get convolution of a sync function with the real spectrum replicated, sync, uh, com convolve with that to give me this, which is my approximation. And what you'll see in the lab today is that if that window is very, very wide, imagine now if this window is even wider. Maybe it's wider than the spectrum itself. You're going to totally destroy the spectrum. So you'll go from maybe have a, having a sinusoid, and if the window is, is, sorry, too narrow, then this thing, if this window is too narrow, this sink will get very, very wide. And when you do the convolution, it's just a big smudged mess. You've lost all the information by spectral leakage. And intuitively, you can understand that. Because if this was a sinusoid over here, maybe it was going up and down like this. The window has to be of a certain length that you can actually see there's a sinusoid in there. Because if I, if I have a sinusoid and I zoom in on one part, as far as I'm concerned, it looks like a straight line. I just see a little piece of it. So I've got to catch enough, enough of the signal so I can see its behavior. So if you've got to guess what this window is, it's unsurprising. And we'll come back to this in, in the spectrum estimation lecture. It's unsurprising that the width of this window is very important for your frequency resolution doing spectral estimation. You've got to capture enough of a waveform to see what its frequency is. 
Okay, so we're pushing up on time now. We've got two very quick pages to go through and then we're done. So the first is the fast Fourier transform, the FFT. This is completely superficial and I, I would have to spend uh, maybe two hours to go through it. It's a beautiful algorithm. It's a divide and conquer approach where you take um, the actual implementation is you say I want to do uh, an FFT of a list of numbers and they say, well, let's not do that. Let's take an FFT of half the list and an FFT of the other half of the list. And somehow, when we're finished, we'll combine them together to get the answer to an FFT of the whole list. And that's the, that's the inventive step. And once you've done that, you can carry it almost like recursion. So you say, okay, but now I go to the smaller list, and I say, rather than do an FFT of that, I break that into two small halves. And so it goes all the way down to the very bottom level, and it's really quick. And because of this idea of divide and conquer, you can see that you want to have a power of 2. So if I had 128 numbers, I would break them into 64 and 64, and then 32, 32, and so it goes all the way down. So you really want a power of 2 for this to happen. Um, just to, something that helped me when I was studying this was to think about the way this calculation happens. And this is what you're going to implement in the lab today, so I think it, it will be of value to you. Is that, so this is the discrete Fourier transform. I want to evaluate the spectrum at some value multiple, remember the M here is an index of frequency, so that's like one mth of the way along a period of the spectrum. Um, so that means something to us in terms of frequency, that index M. Implicitly it means something, we don't have to write it. M minus one. So this is what we had written for the discrete Fourier transform, but my point to you is that it's inefficient, and I'll prove to you, I tried to prove to you superficially, does that make sense? Prove superficially? Probably not. Right, um, sorry, that's a mistake. I know I'm probably confusing you here a little bit, but what I'm saying is normally that would say M because we can have a different number of frequency samples, but traditionally we let them equal to each other because that's the minimum number we would want if we want to do the reverse transform, the inverse transform later. Anyway, let's take an example where maybe N equals M equals 4. And I can write this E to the J, and this will be a trick that you'll use in the exam if I ask you to calculate something like this maybe omega n is equal to e to the minus j 2 pi over 4. Um, what am I doing here? Well, I'm just looking at this. This is a calculation thing, right? I'm just trying to save myself having to write a bunch of stuff out. If you look at this part here, it's e to the minus j 2 pi n m n. n is a constant. 2 pi constant, j constant, e to the j, all constant. The only thing that's changing is m and n. So I might as well make that a constant to the power of n, m. So we call that constant, um, in the textbooks it's written as omega n. So that's the e to the j, 2 pi over 4 in our case for big N, because I've just selected it to be 4. Um, and what is that actually? If, if you calculate, what is e to the minus j, 2 pi over 4? What's 2 pi over 4? Let's start there. Pi over 2. 2 pi over 4 is pi over 2. Okay. So we have e to the j minus, sorry, e to the j minus pi over 2. Think about e to the j, cos theta plus j sine theta. Say it. Negative j. Negative j. Thank you. Yep. So remember, whenever you see e to the j something, it's giving you cos theta plus j sine theta. So in this case here, this value, minus j, is equal to e to the minus j pi over 2. You've gone down that way, that far. Yeah, it's minus j, so negative j. That's by the by. If you, do, if you have to do a question like this on an exam, you want to get that done pretty quickly because that makes your life a hell of a lot easier from that point forward. If you're lucky enough to get something like n equal to 4 where you end up if I gave you n equal to 8, you're screwed because you're going to have cos of 45 plus j sine 45, and that would be a cruel, 
cruel exam question. So let's smash this out. We um, have this is the Fourier transform. I'm just going to write it down. F uh, ba, 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 yeah one. F very two uh, very quickly. So it's going to get messy. F two. F three equals and all of this calculation. And here's the, the samples over here. F of zero. F of one. F of two. F of three. So these are my samples in time. I've taken four of them. And I've decided to, to evaluate four different frequency values. I didn't have to. This, this matrix does not need to be square. I could have had a 1,000 values here and four values there. That's all right. You can do that. And you end up with a, a four, uh, a 1,000. No, it's going to be three, four. It's going to be four columns and a 1,000 rows if you did it that way. Anyway. So you go through it. So you pick a value of m. That's going to put us in a row. And then I evaluate all the values of n. OK? So I'll end up with um, omega n, uh, sugar, n to the power of 0, omega n to the power of 0, n to the power of 0, omega n to the power of 0. And the reason that's 0 is that um, when m is equal to 0, this whole thing is equal to 1, or the whole thing, omega n is equal to the power of 0, and then no matter what I do for n, as it goes through, I end up with 0 to the power, and uh, what else? Let's do the second line down. I get omega n to the power of 0, omega n to the power of 2. The next one's going to be omega n to the power of 4, but what's that going to be the same as? Think about what omega n is. Omega n is a rotation 90 degrees negative. So if I go to the power of 0, it leaves me here. No, no rotation. To the power of 1 is one rotation. To the power of 2, here. To the power of 3, there. To the power of 4, I'm back to the start again. But why do I write to the power of 4? That's the same as to the power of 0, because I didn't go anywhere. So remember, when you multiply complex numbers, you're just rotating around. So omega to the power of 4. Here, omega n to the power of 4 is the same as power of 0. And the, same, the next one would have been 6, but that's the same as 2. That's the periodicity happening. So the, po the point that we're trying to work towards to show you the inefficiency is that, um, for example, for f of 0, it turns out that these are also 0. I've nearly drawn the whole matrix. You end up multiplying, in this matrix operation, you end up multiplying this first sample by f or sorry, by omega n to the power of 0, four times. So that's wasteful. I've done it one, two, three, four times in that matrix calculation. So obviously there is some efficiency which could be made here. And that's what the fast Fourier transform does. So it likes powers of 2. Um, so it likes n equal to 2 to the power of p, whatever that might be. Uh, and someti sometimes it can do uh, primes. Sometimes. You can do primes, but I don't think MATLAB implements it. OK, last slide, and then we're done. This is one of the longest lectures. <coughs> well, the question is, I, I don't have time to go through the whole uh, page of notes, and it's written up in the, in the um, typeset notes, so you can go and have a look at the details if you want. Um, but the question is, I, I want to, I've got a bunch of samples, which is not a pair of two, so maybe, let's choose something simple, maybe five or something, so I've got five samples. Let's draw them. So maybe I have my n equals five. And I want to use a fast Fourier transform, but it's not so it's not a power of two. How can I do that? And if you were really desperate, I don't know, if your life depended on it, you might decide, well look, I'm just gonna stick a bunch of zeros on the end and see what happens. So you go, how many zeros? I need three more. Um, and then I get let's call this um, P P equal to eight, right? It's two to the power of three, so we're happy about that. And then I put this in, and I see what I get back. Uh, 
Well, it turns out, I guess I'll just draw the picture, and you can go and have a look at the notes if you want. This is not important to you, really, practically. I'll just draw one half of the spectrum. Maybe it looks like this. Okay, let's be careful about this. So, if I would have done, if I would have done an F, forget about FFT, the DFT, I say n is equal to five. Let's just bash through it. So I do my 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 m equal to whatever it is, and then the next one I do the summation. I would have ended up with um, so that's if n is equal to m equal to five. I'll end up with samples of this um, over one full interval. Now, I know I'm going to confuse you here because this will continue on um, to pi over 2 pi over t. And so I would have ended up with 5 minus 1. So I end up with three samples in here. Oh, let's just draw it the rest of the way. Look, there's 2 pi over t. Um, let's make it simpler. Okay, that does that. And then the other one kicks off and does this. And that would have continued on. All right, so it's the worst drawing, but this is one half of the spectrum. There's its other half, which would have been here, and it's the start of the next copy of the spectrum up here, and that's the sampling frequency, right? So you're seeing half of the next replication, and normally when we take um, our frequency values, we take m of them spaced over this interval and stop just short. So if m is equal to 5, it'll be 1 over 5. So this will come up to 4 over 5. So I've got to break this into fifths. Um, so like one, yeah, what's fifths, like two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, something like that. So I'll end up with a sample here, here, here. Um, I guess I should end up hitting that one there. Oops. Yeah. So this would have been my f bar of zero f bar of 1, f bar of 2, and this one will be f bar of 3, which is equal to the complex conjugate of f bar of 2, and this one here is the same idea as f bar of 4 is complex conjugate um, of f bar of 1. So that's how you'd normally do it, and you wouldn't go all the way up to the sampling interval a sampling frequency, you'd stop just short, one nth of the way short, and see so if for five you'll end up with one right here and then four spread across the rest like that. Okay. Um, and the ones that you really care about are, are this half down here because they're complex conjugates up there. Now, if I were to take instead this p equal to eight, so I stick three zeros on the end and you smash through all the mathematics and you figure out what's happening, it turns out you get exactly the same spe underlying spectrum back, um, which is this guy here. Let's just call it f bar of j omega. You get exactly the same spectrum back, but it turns out that you're sampling it at different places. So now you're sampling at uh, eights, one eight. So it's, it's p equal to eight, so one eight. So that's, we would need seven across here. Let's try and do that. Um, so that'd be eight. So we'd have a half, and then a half, and a half. So we'd end up with samples which are like here, 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 here. Here, here, here. Um, so it's a very messy drawing, but the point is, if you stick zeros on the end, all that does for you is, well, it allows you to get to a power of two, and you get exactly the same spectrum, but you're sampling at different places. So that's, that's no problem. If you want to use an FFT, I think even if you give MATLAB's FFT a number of samples, which is not a power of two, it will just stick a bunch of zeros on the end anyway and spit you back a power of two answer, as far as I know. Okay, that's a long lecture. We've covered a lot of material, so we've done the sampling theorem, so you know how fast to sample a signal, and what, what the minimum sampling rate is. We got into the Fourier transform, so you know how to take the Fourier a spectrum or Fourier transform of a sample signal, um, and you understand about replication then. 
the problem then was how do you implement that on a computer and we talked about two practical implementation issues. One is that you only have a finite number of samples and the other is that how many points and frequency you're going to evaluate and that's what we're going to deal with in the lab today. So you're going to sample a signal um, you're going to do a Fourier transform over a finite number of samples and then you're going to change the number of frequency points you evaluate at and see what that tells you. Um, yes, question? Is that a question regarding the, uh, the windowing? Yes. So you said that if your window is too large, then your Fourier transform is become too large. You have this flexibility. If it, I think I misspoke. So if the window in time becomes very, very large, then you're heading, you're tending back to the real spectrum then. So actually you get the right answer. It's if the window becomes small, very, very small in time, then the sync function becomes very, very fat in frequency. So when you do the convolution, it becomes an issue. The window width is a problem. You, you can, so you, we'll see this when we do spectrum analysis later on, that it doesn't make sense either to have a really, really, really big window because if the system is non-stationary, then that's a problem because it's doing something down here and then the frequency changes and it does something else up here and you've got this massive window which captures all of that and just blends it together so you, you can't tell, what, you'll see the super, uh, superposition of two frequencies and so that, that will be an issue later where having a big window is not a good thing but at the moment where we're dealing with si these signals which can have any shape, they don't have to be periodic or anything um, but we want to know is if I took a Fourier transform across all time, what's the answer? The wider the window is, the closer to that answer you're going to get. Yeah. Okay, any other questions before we go to the lab? So you'll find, when you get in there, you can crank up MATLAB and you'll find the, the handout up there. Um, and I'll, I'll come in, in about, after I put the camera away and I'll talk you through it. But you can just get set up and give your minds a break because I've just battered you for an hour and a half about signal processing. Okay, good.